Okay, we'll get started five minutes late because we're none of us are on time. Okay, so we're going to start. Sarah is going to make a heroic effort to show you like five slides that summarize the sessions that we had yesterday. Um, look at, we, you know, we did this at the end of a long day yesterday. So as your brains probably felt a little bit like mush, so did ours around this table. Um, if there are things that you think that we missed or you want to sort of make comments about after Sarah presents the slides, we can talk about that. Um, but Sarah, go ahead. Okay, so good morning. I actually have a lot more than five slides um, because I separated the bullet points out. So be ready for that. Um, <laughs> but good morning. Um, I just wanted to thank all of you for your participation in the conversations we had yesterday. It was a long day. Our brains were jello, um, but I am going to do my best. <laughs> and then a special thank you to Lisa, Chris, Carolyn, and Maya, all for their help in preparing these slides after the long day yesterday. Um, so to start off, as a reminder, we started our day yesterday by jumping straight into emerging technologies. Um, some of the key points that we noticed from this session include that there are a number of omic technologies beyond genomics that have advanced to a level at which they are starting to be deployed. And we also noticed that there is a need for these technologies to be better enabled at scale. Um, additionally, there is a balance between innovation and standardization, which exists along a spectrum, and there is a defined need to capture multi-ohms within a single sample. Um, and then continuing on that, we also notice that there's a need for more accessible long read reference data, and that there is a need to de democratize technologies to make them more accessible. And then we also came away with a pretty well-defined question that requires further investigation, which is, is it, is it sufficient to have a causally associated molecular signature or is the causal genetic variant a necessity? So those were our takeaways that we captured from session one. If you have anything else you wanna add, feel free to note it down and then we can talk about that at the end. Um, so session two, uh, we were talking about data sharing. And so from this session, um, we really had like two main conversations. And the first one was about the role that patients have in directing their own data sharing. Um, and we're interested in following up on that topic and that theme um, and figuring out what else is needed to further enable this activity to allow patients to continue data sharing um, and to support them how to provide different levels of involvement for data sharing among, among individuals dif with different preferences for the amount of their data shared, how to enable better informed and proactive consents for these individuals, and if legacy data issues could potentially be overlooked in light of the tremendous amount of data that's being produced in clinical labs. And then in that session, we had another discussion um, that was more focused on <laughs> some points that I was a little bit less clear on. And so I asked for clarification of this morning. <laughs> so bear with me. Um, the first one is that there is a desire to move from two-sided to one-sided to zero-sided data sharing, um, which I just learned this morning is a lot about the hypotheses. Thank you, Nara. <laughs> um, and so this is one of the points we took. And then there is another point about the difference between variant-based data sharing and match ma matchmaking versus sharing additional data types beyond variant and HPO term and determining how to work that into the normal clinical workflow of EHRs. Um, and then some additional points that we noticed during this session was that the prevalence of data siloing is, we're seeing a lot of data siloing um, and there is, it's really important that we determine how to break down those data silos. That's something that we're We've seen a lot of silos in the NHGRI, and so it's a theme, and so we're trying to figure it out. Um, and then the need for employing federations of federated data, which confused me, but I think I have a, a grasp of now. <laughs> um, and then we also had a question about what is needed to actualize data sharing. Um, we noticed the need for guidance on what should be shared and what is useful to share, and then the need for standards and metadata. Okay. And then session three, our main takeaway was that yes, genetics is very complicated. Um, and aside from that, we also learned that phenotypic expression is comprised of genetics, environment, the environment and randomness, which was, didn't know the word stochastic either. So really 
getting some notes in. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so we also learned that there is a need for longitudinal data and that high throughput genome-wide approaches continue to need to complement the to are continued to be needed to complement the deep studies of specific genes and specific phenotypes. Um, we also learned that translational goals and practices can inform approaches in basic biology, that there is a need to better understand the importance of variation in previously excluded regions of the genome, like the centromeres, telomeres, sex chromosomes, and repeat regions, and that context is important. In session four, um, we moved on to linking variants to function, which yielded an understanding that variant to function and coding SNPs have had substantive advances, but everything else, including non-coding SNPs, structural variants, and other kinds of variants need more and different kinds of work, um, that there is a challenge in assessing functional impact of multiple SNPs in combination. Um, and then this last point is basically that there are a lot of models and assays, so you want to know how to apply them to be the most effective. Um, okay. And then we also noticed that there is a need for a place to submit negative data, that there is a need for more understanding about integrating molecular and cellular data to use AI for predicting biology and designing models for functional validation, and that there is a need for better communication among geneticists and individuals involved in functional modeling. In session five, we ended off the day with a discussion about the creation of variant scores, um, which included a desire for continued innovation and generation of variant scores, the value of continuous versus categorical scores, and the use of scores for Bayesian approaches, an understanding of what is being done with the variant scores, an understanding of who is using the variant scores and for what, and a better alignment of community needs with the variant scores. And then aside from the variant scores, we had another part of the conversation, which uh, focused on heavily on machine learning, which included the importance of harmonizing data and metadata, the need for benchmark marking and having test data be truly independent from training data and more interoperable models. And then to put the cherry on top, we ended with a somewhat existential question about what exactly a variant really is. Um, so with that, <laughs> I'm gonna duck out of there. <laughs> Um, and I'll leave you with that and a quick reminder that today will include, we'll have a session about things we may not have previously considered, a session to collect feedback from all of you about what the NHGRI might be able to do to address some of these needs and questions we have from yesterday. Um, and then just a reminder that the meeting materials are available on the QR code. Um, and yeah, thanks for your participation. Um, and. The last thing I wanted to say was that we had a request um, to share emails within the attendees of the meeting. So if anybody has any concerns about that, please feel free to find me and ask me or send me an email. Um, otherwise, we'll probably share a list of all of the attendees and their emails at the end of the day today. So thanks. OK, any additions or corrections to our, rec our uh, summary slides? Go ahead. Andrew. Yeah, I just want to follow up on one point. I really like those slides. Thank you very much for putting that together. In terms of uh, reference maps and leveraging other NIH funded efforts like the All of Us, I think it's also important to think about that when in the context of our discussion on other types of omics, can we leverage All of Us or other NIH funded efforts to make reference maps, not just of genomic data, but of other types of data uh -huh. out there that are going to be pertinent for a lot of these multi-omic aspects that we're envisioning could be very useful for genetic diagnoses. Yeah, and um, go ahead, Nara. Use your microphone, though. On that same line, I was thinking of, like, do we have the, the right, the correct, or the needed support to data sharing of these other data? We have been talking a lot about data sharing for this DNA sequencing, but what about for the all the omics because we need more of that sharing to get better standards for that also i think yeah and you mean within the context of the work that's going on in rare disease already or also that the data that is available in some of these nih resources that you could use is also not easily shared is that yes exactly all okay. all of them right not okay. only on the rare disease but in the the larger community because right. a lot of data is being generated that and it would help us to have these data 
or this function of data from all the samples also that we need beyond yeah. blood. That's what we mostly have right now. And we would love to have it from saliva <laughs> also. So um, I see here, let, let me just ask one more follow-up question. So are there specific data resources that are of particular interest or value that are not easy to get data from? Or are there, are there particular things that we should be aware of when we're thinking about um, existing data sets that would be useful that we haven't maybe thought of? Yep, Doug. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, I feel like for functional data, the state of the world is pretty bad, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, multiplex functional assays, I think are, have, and then there are, we're trying to curate those and even that corner of the world is not great. But once you kind of get into the long tail of N equal one or a few experiments, I think it's, it's my understanding is that clinicians are still mostly going and like reading individual papers yeah. to find functional yeah. information. And that, that seems like a pretty significant roadblock. Right. Okay. Right. Chris, you have a follow-up too. So what's needed there? Is the obstacle the bytes of like the sharing the data or the standards, the tools to work with it, those sorts of pieces? Uh, uh, my hot take is that the incentive structure is not aligned with what people want to do. So I think that the that there there are, I mean, there are places people can put, I mean, put functional data if they want to, but they have to do that, you know, and it's, it's, it often, I think stops with the, this is true for multiplexed assays and low, low, lowplex assays, right? It, once you publish your paper, the supplementary table, like you've complied with the right. data sharing requirement. And then like, can you flog or do you want to spend your nights and weekends, log the postdoc or student or spend your nights and weekends uploading that data with all the metadata into some database you know, I and mean, the same problem is reflected, in my opinion, and, you know, Heidi and others talked about it with ClinVar and clinical data sharing, right? right? Like, it's it's a voluntary activity that few people want to do. So I think my perspective is that uh, NIH can choose to make more sticks, which nobody wants, or they can choose to fund some carrots, which I think everyone will be happier about. So my opinion is that what is the key ingredient that is missing is active, high-quality curation, right? which is like effectively impossible to get money to to do that's that's my two cents eric do you have a follow-up on this it's, yeah it's okay. actually yeah and it's it's something that kind of it was sort of left out of the, the summary because it was a little bit subtle when it was presented but I, I think there's an opportunity to automate this using using new techniques that are coming online and that, that was, came up in our discussion but um, multimodal data and language models they do they do provide a, a basis for automating a lot of this kind of curation work to the extent that maybe people, you know, the researchers who are contributing data can, can be absolved of some, some of the responsibility of curating mm -hmm. it. Right. And now how realistic that is, it's not clear. It's like, that's, that's the cool research project. Maybe that discovery is the carrot that can, that can kind of help, help everyone here. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. And then Nayar, do you have a follow-up on this point too? Yeah. Just a, uh... In addition to like difficulties that we have to uh, share our own data, I think one or trying to improve that, I think one of the key things is to have a clear link between which data correlates with uh, which genetic mutation or, or which disorder, right? So all these like data sharing uh, resources or uh, activities are completely disconnected. So right. you, yeah, so having like the link between those things, I think would also uh, okay. help. Good. Uh, Tanya, oh wait, is, is, your, is yours on the same point? Okay, sorry. We'll go to Steve and then we'll go back to Tanya. She had, uh, I think, another comment. I, I just think that even if we like flash forward and say for one variant, if we had all the impacts across contexts, cell types, cell states, like there's a huge dimension of data just for one variant. Right. How to give that? And the answer is no for most columns, except for the one where it actually has a point in yeah. that specific disease. And so figuring out how to display that data, it just, it's very different data than what is currently in ClinVar. And so I think yeah. that's also a big hurdle of how to get that high dimensionality data into these types of um, 
databases in ways that are useful. Yeah. And I, and I complain about this all the time. All my colleagues are tired of hearing me say this, but like also that people who generate the data are generating it to do one thing and thinking of one use case. Uh, but like, you have to also think of other possible use cases because not everybody is going to use it in the same way. Not everybody can access it or understand it in the same way. And that's a big challenge, but something I think we need to think about. Okay, Tanya, you were you had a comment in the back that I think was probably a different point. Yeah, thanks so much. The, the slides are really great. Uh, summary, really helpful. Um, I just wanted to add um, one comment on the data sharing is caring panel, the session two. I think some of the points were, it's not just that um, patients are, um, rare disease patients, um, many of them really want to share their data. I think the point is more that patient-led rare disease organizations are really essential partners in enabling data sharing. Um, and they're also building and they're actually creating really important research enabling assets mm -hmm. in the forms of, of registries and biobanks that if we can help ensure that those are standardized and consistent and have this consistent quality, they could be really critical resources right. for helping to interpret variants and, and doing and moving the ball forward in this space. And so I think that's more part of part of the point that was maybe missing on that I think okay. slide four. Okay, that's helpful. Okay. Other other comments or things that we forgot or you wanted to expand upon Deanne? Couple things. Um First of all, going back to the curation idea, it's another data resource problem. So it's not just making AI, but making the structures that AI can use. And th that is a little bit di divided. Yep. Because, you know, putting together all this curation of the LLMs and stuff like that, or you need to be able to build those resources before you can run things like like predictive AIs or anything like that. So um, that, that kind of a data resource problem. The other thing is going back to the patient thing. I agree. Kids first did that. Um, they actually interfaced. I, Chris might remember. I don't know if you were involved with that, but there's there's a the common fund is part of the common fund. They they brought in a lot of patient groups and interacted with them as part and had them kind of you know put out the call for for getting genomes involved. And Kids First wanted to do this, but I don't think there were resources to actually engage the pet patients at that level, but they were still engaged. So we used to have meetings with lots of patient groups and they're very friendly to this idea. So, you know, that might be, that might be a low hanging fruit for NIH is to actually some sort of resource for them. Okay. Yep. Okay, Heidi. So one thing that wasn't in the data sharing section that's probably worth adding, there's, there's no mention of any global efforts. Um, and so I, I do think it's given the rare, incredibly rare nature of what we work on, we have to figure out ways to collaborate across countries. And so I just think it's important to, and, and I think it's two different, well, I'm sure there's many dimensions, but there's data sharing. There's also just collaboration convening to work together on things. And so I, I think it's important to have something there in that realm. Okay. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, so the for our next session, uh, Carolyn Hutter is going to come up here. And, you know, we've had discussions over the last couple of days on these sort of five main topics that we identified as important areas that we thought that there were barriers, but we probably didn't think of everything. And so in this session, we're going to talk about those things that we haven't considered um, what we need to be thinking about more. And then Carolyn is going to get you started on an exciting post-it note based activity. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, you know, this part, this section, um, I don't have any slides. This is really the point is, as, <clears throat> as Lisa said, we sort of came up and structured our agenda around the five areas of technologies, data sharing, genetics, functional data, and computational tools. And part of the question is, are there major topics or areas that you were like, would expect to be important as we think about this conversation of what are the research needs in addressing discovery and diagnosis in rare, rare diseases? Not the clinical application needs, but the research needs. 
are there aspects that we're missing and or you did a pretty good job yesterday, but there's always also the spaces in between, right? When you create different sections, sometimes things get, we don't make the bridges or we don't catch the spaces in between. So is there something people really thought they were gonna come here and talk about that we didn't or things that they we didn't really touch on yesterday that you think you really think we should? prime ready that require kind of scale up and standardization and there are other ones that may be more amenable to kind of deeper dives if you will in research setting um, and what, what i'm kind of curious about is that in, whether or not there is um, any gri's interest or others in trying to identify and prioritize and select uh, amongst plethora of technologies uh, ones that there should be a kind of organized effort to try to assess, particularly, uh, you know, around things like, you know, health system impact uh, for, for integration of these technologies, you know, because uh, I, I think this whole field can continue to move somewhat organically, uh, you know, driven by passionate people, right? Uh, but, but you know, I think there could be maybe a broader uh, assessment and, and some sort of a, uh, you know, kind of a game plan, if you will, for, for integration. And, and that's just kind of one thing that I think um, you know, an organization such as NAGRI uh, could be a kind of key key player in. Yeah, no, and I mean, that comes a little bit to what I think I had as the homework question, which you also were touching on a little bit in the summary from yesterday, which is when you look at the state of the field right now, how much of, we, what are we seeing as a key barrier being a, a role or a need for facilitating making the data that's out there or that's expected to be coming out there fair, for lack of a better, you know, find, findable, accessible, brought together in a way where, you know, someone could make Steve's hypothetical matrix or even maybe make that matrix versus there's key data, the key that like a data generation effort is still needed on specific types of data. And then if so, which, and then a separate question is how do we, how do we really determine
<laughs> but the other, uh, I guess, follow up on that, you know, most genomic testing in this, you know, in our country is going to be done by commercial labs. And thinking about this from a data sharing perspective, this may be a very naive question, but is there a role or is there a possibility of actually getting that data into this shared environment? When we're thinking about this, like, can we create sort of a genomics England that's not being, you know, out of uh, sort of U, uh, NIH funded stuff, but actually out of, you know, these commercial lab whole genome sequencing that then can be, you know, consented appropriately. And, you know, maybe there needs to be funding for this to put that into a central repository for people to do all everything they want to from a genomic centric perspective. Right. So I think that the challenge is always going to be is when we're thinking about trying to create these large cohorts, we're doing a genomic centric matching we're just never going to get to the numbers if we're only doing this sort of one-off, you know, efforts, you know, um, and unless we sort of leverage these commercial efforts. Right. Heidi, and then Gary. Just to follow up on that, you know, I've been thinking a lot, uh, actually, this morning walking here around the clinical lab side of this. And, you know. Did you, like, walk across the highway? Yes. Um, <laughs> Tanya Garrett and I walked the whole way here 45 minutes with luggage. <laughs> I did that it was, one time. It was an experience, I, actually. I, just I did that one time, and there was a construction, and it was, like, ridiculous. But I'm glad that you... Yeah, there was some suicide. clearing of sidewalks that would have been useful. But anyway, uh, moving on. So um, I, I think, you know, if clinical labs were able to actually apply for small seed grants or some sort of grant mechanism to help with, you know, Paul mentioned yesterday, where's Paul back there, um, that, you know, he hired four genetic counselors just to manage the gene matcher submissions and, and has like discoveries he can't even publish because he doesn't have staff to work on the paper writing. Like, um, so, and the, cons you know, upfront consent and, you know, if patients actually had a mechanism consent, like the clinical labs can't manage consenting patients. That's a huge resource burden. So like for clinical labs who were willing to engage, and a lot of them I think would, to have some small grants to provide some resources to them to get that, you know, all that rich pipeline of information, data, samples, patients into the system, I think could be in instrumental. Gary, and then. Yeah, so as I think, sitting here, you said yesterday, if you had unlimited amounts of money, mm -hmm. what would you do? But first, you really got to think of a point of view of what do you want to achieve? Do, do you want to annotate every single variant in the human genome across all humans and their implications? Do you want to do a subset of them? And how would you define the subsets that are important, perhaps the medically relevant ones? And then how much money do you want to spend on it, right? Because I sent in a slide saying with what the work we've done so far in CFTR costs $16,000 per variant for us. Right. Okay. So probably could be done less than that, but that's completely vetted. Stead, stands the test of time. In a couple of years, we'll be up to about probably 2,000, which will be 99.99% of all variants described in that gene in all humans, all studied at population level, functional level, and, and with clinical data to support it. You can do it if you plan it and you spend the money, but it's not cheap. So you have to decide what you want to do. You have to decide how much you want to spend. And then if you're going to spend it, what vehicles are you going to use to implement the process, right? So I know we're struggling. We've got lots of great ideas, a lot of good people in here, but you got to frame this whole thing in order to get this done. Right. And let me suggest one vehicle that we used some years ago that actually is available is CTSAs, right? The Clinical Translational Science Awards, which are substantial in size that many large universities have, and in which within a structure the NIH created some years ago, our clinical diagnostic lab, along with others, were all designing assays, sharing data, De developing functional uh, assays and working directly with our clinicians in a variety of different uh, disorders. And particularly, it was clinician generated. They came to us and we would work with them, develop the assays. And that, because the clinicians were buying in and they were the ones who brought it to us, they actually provided all the data that we needed to put the phenotype right. back with. So I think there are vehicles to carry this out that NIH already has. Uh, but I, I would suggest for the group, maybe a little framing of this might, might help. What do we really want to? achieve first and how much money do you really have to spend <laughs> <laughs> so we'll come to we'll come to that a little bit when we get ready to talk about the recommendations but ali yeah i, I just want to double down on what heidi said i, I think you know especially post covid these commercial labs are struggling they are just getting by and then to put you know to ask for anything in addition i think you know it, it's just it's just too much right and so i think seed grants 
And then we're leveraging an infrastructure that already exists for them to put you know, data into. So we're not funding additional data generation. They're already generating that data, I think is a great way to, to leverage what's, what's already existing in a, a responsible fiscal way. But they need some support. Like they're barely getting by, operate razor thin you know, gross margins, they're struggling. <laughs> other, oh, go ahead. Just one other comment on the functional data aspect. You know, most of these functional studies are largely investigator driven right now. And I think one of the slides that was put up yesterday, which was kind of striking is that if you look at all the rare diseases, the far majority of individuals affected by rare diseases only account for around like a, a couple hundred genes total. Like, is there any um, utility of rather than it being sort of investigator driven in terms of which genes to go after, more of having funding mechanisms saying these are the top hits for genes that we should be doing this and then have the investigator driven aspect being how do you creatively design the best functional assay for those genes that are sort of the top priority? Nara? No, I was just thinking aloud that Andrew was saying that how do we decide what the priorities are? So how do we put one disease above a, another disease? So I'm I'm not sure I agree with that approach, Andrew, because I, I think it's hard to decide what disease is more important than what. And I think there is a space and need for us to learn as much as possible about all the genes that cause diseases. So I don't think it's fair to pick a, a set of genes and say, like, you all have to deal with these ones. Well, what's our mortality? Mortality, mortality. Right, so, well, yeah, but then. So in the then, scope of the way that, and so I will, you know, this is where you get into a little inside by, by baseball, right? So NIH as a whole has made decisions about how money split up amongst different diseases through what we call the categorical institutes or the disease focused institutes. At NHGRI, we're disease agnostic, and we, when we do focus on a specific, we will sometimes focus on a specific disease or area with the idea that you're doing that to then advance everything, right? So you, a little bit to Gary's point, if you try to do everything at, all at once, we don't get to live in that movie, right? So we have to think about ways to focus. And so the question to me would be, if we did some prioritization, how are we make, How do we approach specific the specific diseases or specific genes we decide to focus on first in ways that will be informative to further studies? How do we? What are the generalizable things? You would. You're also doing the specific stuff, but by doing that, are you creating some tools or infrastructure or methods that then will allow follow up and expansion into other areas? And when you get very boutique and specific, then that's where we start to say, is this no longer? our remit versus other remits. But I do think there is a question sometimes of the prioritization, not to say that this is, it is, we're not, you're making some important decision, but I think there's also a prioritization for the purpose of focusing to move the field forward. And then the hope then if we're doing it is it would move the entire field forward in this for forefront way where other people could then build on this and use these tools and approaches to expand Brought more broadly, so that's just one way to think about what you what we think of at an, from an NHGRI view when we talk about that type of prioritization. I have a hand in the back, and then coming forward. So, this uh, responding to your comment, um, are, are there like NHGRI is obviously focused on genomes, um, right? So, are there cases we heard of some, but it, it could could you imagine collecting cases where we we really really think that there's a genomic cause, but no existing technique, no standard technique has resolved it because we're, we're, we, we're approaching like complete assembly of genomes being an automated thing, right. but there's still this small gap that seems small in, in the abstract, but in reality is, is apparently a, a gulf. You know, people haven't jumped across it to really um, go after cases that, you know, all evidence says it's genomic, but, but none, of the, none of the kind of standard of long read sequencing approaches, uh, reference guided things have, have managed to work on that. Um, that, that could be an interesting, Yeah, I don't know how you'd organize it. Maybe it would be a bunch of case studies in effect. Um, maybe there's some particular disease classes or types that really have this in spades and like would, would benefit and could be a, a kind of case study 
a, a not case study, but a, a focused um, cohort for this kind of exploration that, you know, if it works, it might be really fascinating yeah. um, and be really motivating. Um, and if it doesn't, it probably is a kind of discovery on its own. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. So that is kind of Gregor, what Gregor is right now. So the goal of Gregor is to develop strategies and approaches to solve cases that we're pretty sure are genetic, but they've had all the standard sort of clinical genetics testing and still are not solved. And so what what is it that is needed to try to identify genetic cause in those cases? Like how do we find, and that's that's also what we're asking here today, right? That, that's really what the key challenge is that we wanna keep trying to, to solve. Um, Cause there are just so many cases that you think are genetic and you do all the genetic testing and you don't find, there has to be something that's going to get us there. I don't know what that I'm, thing is, I mean, I, but I'm, that's why we're, that's why we're here to talk about. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm clearly ignorant, but I'm also working on the techniques that might support that. Is there right. just a communication yeah. issue that's going on? Like, you know, like I, I didn't, I didn't realize that that, I didn't realize exactly that that was Gregor's remit and, and um, you know, is it like, yeah, let's let's perfectly assemble all these genomes and across many tissue types. Is is that kind of happening yet, or is it? So, like, is it really at the absolute vanguard of the uh, of the the sequencing analysis tech? Is my question because that that tech is is pushing us to like totally see the genomes, and that would seem to be the natural resolution, at least from a genomic perspective. Um, uh, modulo the issues of somatic mosaicism and these kind of problems that are they're difficult for for assembly. But what what, what do you? I mean. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Like, like I, I was ignorant, but I could be helping. And so is there, is there like a. Yeah. No, so yeah. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. Karen. Yeah. So I think, I think the answer to your question is some of this is we do. And we discuss this sometimes in NHGRI is this question of, is some of this communication, are we connecting correctly? Are we helping the community connect with other people? And this is a thing that also came up yesterday, right? Like you have, then you the person with their variant in a lab and then who how do they know where those the d different groups and people are to your point you know we're doing um you know a lot of really advanced work in the in the telomere to telomere and human genome research program and we're supporting that are we bringing that the the totality of what we have there into this space and the answer is right now no right and we're we're making on rows and we're trying to do that and as we continue and as we develop the next program, that's part of one of the things we're likely going to be thinking about is how do we how do we push in those areas and how do we define the connect, you know, the just like I was talking this morning about the connection between the topics we talked about, there's the connections between the different activities that are happening out there that is part of how things progress and how we can try to move these things forward. So I think that there is some work being done. So to answer this currently in Gregor, there is some work being done in long read sequencing and how can bringing that type of technology in go beyond what's done with sort of typical short read sequencing, but not the full spectrum of what could be done in that space. And so that's a, that's one question is would a, would a coordinated push in that area help and when's the right time and what's the right way to do that? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think the timing is really the question, right? Because exactly. the, the costs are modulating really right. fast. And and so, yeah, it, it's it's a question about wanting to do that. But it, it seems like that'd be right. great. Yeah. And it comes back a little bit to Heidi's point yesterday about the innovation versus standardization and what, what parts of this are we innovating in and what are the structures and ways to do the innovation and when are things, what are the, what are the things that are, we know are going to work and we've done those initial pilots and we understand that and how do we push those to standardization or more broad adoption and sort of balancing both of the exploration that's needed in both of those spaces as well. Gary and then Doug. Yeah, I just want to emphasize again what you're say, saying. I mean, I, 2010, when we discussed where things would go, uh, integration and interaction and consultation with the other institutes was a big part of it. Right. Unfortunately, I now see that was aspirational, perhaps a bit more than actually in actuality, but now's a chance to do this again. The entire NIH is devoted to improving human health right. and genetics certainly can be a driver of that. I think people acknowledge it, but genetics has come a long way in 15, 14 years. Right. 
And I think there's more of my colleagues in other areas of clinical and research science that accept the role of genetics and genomics uh, in what they do. And they may be more receptive to having greater interactions now if you have consultation with the NHLBI, NIDDK, because they have their own kind of, yeah. talk about silos, you know it, right? They have their own <laughs> silos. So, you know, but interaction across this, this common platform and common currency of life seems to make a lot of sense to a lot of people. So I, I just want to add my few cents to encourage the points you're making there, that trying to do this uh, as an effort and reaching out where you can have some success with these right. different institutes, because those institutes have lots of funding, a lot more fun you guys have, with uh, a, a lot of that basic science and other kind of stuff we want to see get done. So uh, perhaps that could be a, a main thrust or at least another theme that you've continued, but started but i'd like to really reinforce that one yeah and so just for um just to put a point on this for people who haven't sort of thought about this if you look at our 2020 strategic vision one of the figures that we highlight in there is how much of human genomics is ha is being funded at nih outside of nhgri like we used to be the, the only people in the game and it's now very widespread and we do a lot of times and spaces where we try to partner with other groups and then it's both and it's that recognition of our expertise and their expertise and bringing both of those together. And so one of the things that we can think about and, and previously, for example, in the earlier versions of the CMGs, we did partner with a couple of other institutes and, the, and Gregor, we're not doing that. Some of that is timing. I'll be blunt as budgets get tighter collab the silos get silo -ier. <laughs> um, So that's something we have to overcome. But I do think that there is a question about how to facilitate the, the knowledge and resources of NA NIH writ large. And that's come up even in some of the other places where people are talking about if all of us is doing these types of efforts, how can we interface and build in and support what they're doing to make that go further as opposed to reinvent that. And to me, it's also the problem when we at NIH, and we're guilty of it to reinvent wheels. And then you guys are all like, now we've got six different wheels out there and we only really need two for our bicycle. What's happening? Like, I think that's another spot. So Doug, I think you had your hand up. Oh yeah, I guess I just, you know, thinking about, trying to think about this from the NHGRI perspective, it seems like there's kind of two key tasks, right? There's variant discovery, and there's understanding what variants do. And my view is that in both cases, the tech stack is like pretty, it seems pretty clear, like kind of where we are now, where what's like coming immediately and what pie in the sky stuff is needed. And I can't speak to the variant discovery part. That's not my role, although there's been great discussion at this meeting about it. On the variant, like what do variants do space? It At the moment, if you go looking, Right. If you have find some random variant in a random gene, the, the best case scenario is that there is a reasonably good computational predict uncalibrated computational prediction of that variant's effect, and that's it. And then there's some like pathway and gene level information you might find in some databases, maybe. And I, I just think that's a problem. That like that's a solvable problem, right? Like we can do better with calibrating predictions. And as you know, and I'm not gonna give my shtick, right? We can make functional data available for many, many more variants. And it seems to me that that is, like that is an NHGRI remit problem, right? Where like, that is a resource that would empower all those other institutes and all the individual researchers who go on and try to find out what their variant does, like that would, that would be a benefit. So that, I mean, you knew I was gonna say that, this is the moment I'm saying it. But, <laughs> but I think that's a problem we can and should try to solve. Other comments or questions? Yeah, maybe to follow up on that a little bit. You know, I was thinking last night about session four was functional validation. And I wonder if validation is the wrong term, the wrong way to think about it. I think functional interrogation is a much mm -hmm. better way to think about it. And as not a capstone, and I think often, certainly in the animal model world, it's often viewed, we'll make the mouse model at the end, showcase you know, one example of all these discoveries, but I really think certainly the high throughput screening and cell-based systems, but even, uh, you know, we're getting to a point where animal modeling and, and other organismal modeling can be useful as uh, evidence generation in addition to just sort of showcasing or giving a final uh, cherry on top for the nice paper. 
And so I think this sort of uh, discussion about integrating uh, those who look to understand what uh, interrogating variants or, or even genes at a seat at the table in a coordinated fashion mm -hmm. as part of the discovery process, I think would be very valuable because that evidence is useful at many steps along the way, not just at the final step. Ashley? So just a quick comment. Um, you know, when we're selecting variants for functional analysis, a lot of that is driven by whether there's an interesting biological finding or outcome that would be discovered. And so I guess my larger question is, you know, how, how do we change how we prioritize variants for functional analysis to benefit the community rather than just understanding biology and whether that's important or not for patients? That's a great point because that's what investigators do and that's how they get funded, right? Yeah. Is picking the interesting ones because they can publish them. That's why you have to have funded efforts to do everything and the entire thing in Gene, even if it's not interesting. And I can say it's a boring plotting in the trenches kind of approach, but once you get it going, you try to finish the whole job, but you, you have to be committed to do the whole thing, not just parts of it. It's like a lot of these other projects we're talking about here because otherwise investigators will be very tempted to cherry pick Hey, that seems interesting, and then run off, write their R01 on that, and then they're not committed to finishing the job along with their consortium of other groups or whoever they're working with to finish up those functional assays. So whatever your structure, you have to make the incentivization to do everything, even the not so apparently in uninteresting thing. But I will finish and say amongst the un apparently uninteresting things are some of the most interesting discoveries, as we all know in science. So there is reward in sometimes plotting through the uninteresting. I think just to follow up on what you said, that kind of gets to the point we discussed a little bit yesterday is like really communicating what the bar is from both sides. Like um, I find that people are hesitant to put forward anything more than their very best candidates because the, the downstream work seems hard. But then, you know, Steve is saying, no, 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 please, <laughs> we, we want more things. And I think just have, getting both of those groups to communicate a little bit better about what we're looking for and like what stage is is fine to to do that because you're right there is a lot to learn um just about variant function and we also have other efforts at nhgri that are doing variant to function sort of uh analysis and mapping and creating resources we also need to think about ways to use that information better in the context of the work that we're doing in prioritizing variants that you're going to go further with and i think we're uh, we need have a lot of work to do in that area. I'm also interested to hear sort of what the barriers are in using that kind of information and how we can do that better. Yeah, to, to this point, I wanted to add, so we are here discussing a little bit how we prioritize variants, prioritize genes, right? And I was thinking on the mouse phenotyping consortium, there is no prioritization. Let's just knock out all the genes and see what is the phenotype of the mouse, right? At the level of iPSCs, organoids, and I don't think that is any effort like this, right? So that could be something interesting to think well, about. Morphic, I think, is is essentially that for IPSCs, although I don't know. They're early in their early stage right now. Um, they, are, they are. I just saw Adam walk right out of the room as soon as you mentioned Morphic. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but yeah, they, they are at an earlier stage, but you're right. Yeah. Yeah. And so we could add variants to that too, right? So take like a missense variants and, and do like a in a high throughput way, uh, analyze for this gene. Like for example, I, I work in a gene, right? So for me, I have uh, assays or models set for checking the knockout phenotype, but it wouldn't be difficult for me to check like a, an array or missense variants in these genes, just like take all the amino acids and uh, look what happens in this specific assay, right? So identifying maybe um, researchers that are interested in a specific genes that have models to test um, those things easily, well, easily not, but. <laughs> yeah, and then Doug, obviously, if you yes. want to follow up on. I, mean, I, I just think in genomics, our brand is to scale the crap out of everything, right? Yeah. So like, uh, I think I think we should, if we can make every mass knockout, we should do it. Like if we can measure every variant effect, we should do it. And I don't think, I don't think getting parochial about, okay, we've got a prior, I mean, sure, there's gonna be a list, right? And the things we would do first and last 
may, may, there's, you want some sensible way to do that. But if we're, I don't think we're in a situation where it's like, okay, well, these 10 genes are going to get attention. And then like the other 4,990, we're just never going to be able to visit. I think even with technology we have today, right, we can, we can do, we can think comprehensively. And, and so I think that's the zone I, that to me, that feels like our brand. Right. And that's what we should do. That's my opinion. So, oh, go ahead. I think we can be comprehensive, but, you know, oftentimes with these functional validations, if there are no, uh, no positive outcome, you know, those don't get reported. And then people are, different people are sort of re doing the same thing over and over again, you know. Uh, so is it possible to sort of have a repository to, and this is going back to talking about negative data, you know, reporting negative data when there is no, uh, no obvious functional impact? So go ahead and comment on that and then- I'll Just to respond really quickly, I think that's one helpful thing about trying to do work in a comprehensive context. Like if you're doing a project where you're gonna knock out every mass gene, then you report every knockout, right? If you're measuring every variant, you know, every single nucleotide variant in a gene, then you report all the data. And it, it isn't, the expectation isn't that you only report the positive results, you report everything. I mean, that's glossing over the important problems. And I agree with everything you said additionally, but I just wanted to make that point. But I also, I see your hand, but I also think it, I mean, it ties into also, I thought you were gonna say some of the stuff you're doing in MAVE-DB where people are also explaining, like, I, you know, we're, I'm going after this gene and this gene is happening. Or to Gary's point, the idea of the comprehensiveness is you're saying, I'm gonna track down everything and follow everything, right? And so the commitment is there that the negative findings get put out and you don't have that same, I think the, the publication of negative findings in those types of contexts isn't even a, a thing because you're not, it's your, your finding is I'm reporting on everything and some things will have a reporting that looks like this and other things will have a reporting that doesn't look like that. It's when you do cherry picking that negative findings, I think becomes an issue and a concern and are those missing. And so some of it I think is this idea of, of having understanding who's doing things comprehensively, how are, what are, what is the support around those? How do we make it that data findable coming back? How do we, so people can know here's our huge thing and here's the points that are filled out for this particular variant or this particular gene. And then how do you also have some information about who's working in a space, but the results aren't there yet. And then the, the ability to have it there. And I'm not like, there's a lot to that if you were gonna actually implement that and what are we even implementing it on? Like what fills up that cube to me is part of the question. Um, and when we get to the recommendation part, people can make suggestions around that. But I also think that is, the idea of how are you approaching it? And I think the prioritize, when I was talking about the prioritization, it is those cases where you have to do some stuff first, right? Morphic can have a long-term goal of doing everything, but they have to pick a first set of things that they're working on where they work out the kinks and this is how this whole thing's gonna work, right? You can't do 10,000 at your starting point, even if that's a goal. Yeah, I think I was just gonna follow up and say that, um... Well, first of all, on that point about prioritization, I think about a sensible order of operations, right? right? Uh, you know, you 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 don't do things that perhaps replicate what's already been done first, you know, leave that maybe for later. I think uh, the other thing I'm hearing is that there's certainly this uh, different remit for a resource generating project versus basic research projects. And I think, you know, when that is organized carefully at the certainly the funders level, that everybody can get on board with this. And then the other point about negative data, definitely that is one of the key things, resources around mouse phenotype effort. Um, you know, but that anything that requires new data types would require very careful building of that data infrastructure to support the reporting from the beginning. Uh, you know, the only reason we've been successful with this is that this was built from the ground up, starting with this mission 15 years ago. I think it very hard to shoehorn these things into existing resources and databases. I I know that's a challenge yeah. to rebuild new databases, but yeah. it's a it's a critical part. And ultimately it could be deployed for community benefit as well. People could report their own stuff through that. It's difficult, but that could be leveraged for that as well. So Anshul, I see you put your camera on. Were you coming on to say something or just joining us in general? Um I, I just um I think I missed the exact question, but from what I can tell, um 
I think there's value to also thinking about using computational models to help design experiments. And I think while they might not be at the stage of replacing experiments at all right now, uh, they are definitely at the stage where they can help prioritize. So that could be an interesting way of, uh, in situations where the, you know, where there is an infinite budget and you need to make tough choices, that that could be a good, good route forward. Chris, and then. So we're talking about being comprehensive. Yesterday, we also were talking a lot about the importance of context. So how do those two, um, how do we balance those two? And what does it mean to be comprehensive in a world where we're also saying the entire genetic background is also important? <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, and that was actually about what I was going to say was if you do a comprehensive genetic screen, you've done it potentially in that one cell line. So that is the function in that one, in the context of that one genome, right? And there are definitely techniques developing like similarly to all of our omics where you can do it across multiple cell lines in, in kind of minimally uh, environmentally varied way, ways, but that, that in and of itself, the genome of the cell line the assay was done is should be partnered with the uh, functional data coming out and needs to be part of the analysis too. Yeah, Doug and then Nara. I think I would just say, I mean, I think you apply simple, cheap assays everywhere and you see what's left, right? And it, it's, it's like a sieving kind of approach where like the prob probably many variants in most variants in most protein coding genes are going to have effects you can see from space in simple cell lines, right? And then when you talk about non-coding variants, when you move to other genes that have cell types, like there are going to be exceptions, right? But by generating the data or at least doing careful piloting, and I really liked Anshul's comment, right, about trying to synergize better predictions and experiments, right? You you see, okay, well, here's the set of variants and genes and non-coding functional elements, but we're going to have to use, you know, maybe it's mo moderate throughput, low throughput, whatever. I, that's the way I would think about it. Now, I was just going to say, like, there are some people doing that, picking up some genes and going through all the variants. Dr. Kar is one of them. Jay Shandur is another one who has done it. And um, um, Nick at Hopkins has done for CDK and 2A. One PKU, exactly. So one thing I was going, I want to add is when we test that one gene with that one functional, test, we are not testing all the functions of the gene. So just for us to keep in mind that we pick one function, I'll say, and test one of the functions that we are interested on, and it's negative, doesn't mean that that the one variant doesn't do something else. So we may actually need an array of functional tests to actually understand all the possible functions of that one missense. I'm not saying we should not do one. I'm just saying to keep in mind that if one is negative, doesn't mean that that variant doesn't do anything else. We may need to test it many other times with many different assays. So it's just, I'm not saying we don't do the few that we can assays. I'm just saying we keep it in mind that one negative doesn't mean it's over. We don't have more work to do. So Heidi, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. You added to Sarah's summary a discussion about the importance of considering especially when we're in this rare disease space, the global approach. And this is admittedly not a global meeting, mostly for um, NIH bias and, and cost reasons. Um, but what I just wanted to open it up to the group to because I, I don't think we did discuss that in much detail yesterday. If there's specific things or thoughts people want to share or raise in terms of what does having this, what aspects of this do you, people think are important for us to think about engaging on globally and what does that mean and or look like? Yeah, I mean, I think I think we need ways to, to share data. Like for example, a paper that just got posted a couple of weeks ago um, by Nikki Whiffen's group based on being able to analyze the entire gel data set, find a common single variant, and then reached out to us because we happened to collaborate and we immediately looked in our data set and found eight de novos. It's now it looks like it's one of the single most common variants causal for neurodevelopmental mm -hmm. disorders. I, it's just almost 1% of the entire neurodevelopmental patient population. There's 96 authors on this paper. And it all happened through like word of mouth and right. connections that were just like, hey, hey, do you have this variant in your data set? And you know, so on. And then 
Paul was like, well, Seth just told me that this variant were, you know, like, like it's all word of mouth, right? So the, the question is, can we can we actually set up a little better infrastructure to to enable the sort of data sharing approaches across countries and and better collaborations? It doesn't mean you're funding other right. countries to do work. They're being funded already through other sources. But how can we work together? Because you know, Nikki almost dismissed this as a technical artifact. She's like, there's no way I can have 46 cases of a, you know, an, uh, an Indel variant in this. It's got to be an artifact. And, and that's why she reached out to us. So, like, I just want to make sure that we think about ways to both share data and collaborate globally. And are there ways to do that that are, you know, a little more than word of mouth sort of approaches? Right. Can I ask you a follow-up question, Heidi? So I mean, it's my understanding that that would have been enabled, right, by Matchmaker Exchange. So why, what is not there right now to and it have enabled that to happen in any other way than somebody sending you an email and asking you, like, why, why did that not work this time and what could we do to make that easier? Well, I think this one worked because it was so common that Nikki was able to find it in one gel data set. Albeit, gel is a very large data set, and our data sets aren't actually that large that we have. Gel is genomics. Sorry, England. genomics England. I, okay, I just got that. Thing. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I worry that if we each have our small data sets we're looking at right now, Gregor is only you know twenty five hundred I think that are sitting in Anvil, um, not connected with the CMG data sets, which are spread across sixty four workspaces. So like. Finding those commonalities are actually hard if the data is not harmonized. So, you know, the question is, can we actually physically join data sets with joint calling like we did for Gregor, but we actually do it across international data sets? And or are there ways to do federated analyses, which are being worked on, um, but can we enable them so we're not, it's not a word of mouth because, you know, like, like if that wasn't as common as it was, it wouldn't have happened the way it did. How about and then Nara? Uh, yeah, I, on the global side, the one thing I wanted to, um, you know, uh, from my observations, looking across the landscape of the field, the in resource poor environments, there's tend to be a lot less sequencing and a lot more genotyping. Um, and this goes especially for, you know, continents, for instance, Africa, where there's, you know, much less resources to, you know, do these. And while I love the, you know, the, the push to long reads and to get, you know, to be completionist, that's just not going to happen in Africa anytime soon. Let's be realistic about that. It is, it is very, very challenging to do a lot of, you know, harder, you know, to do very expensive work there, to do scale, to get, um, to get at large, you know, um, numbers of individuals, you know, short read sequencing. Like what I'm trying to encourage is a, a, a thought to get even you know, some of these environments away from genotyping and towards short read sequencing. We can get them to long read eventually too. That'd be great. But even just that first push, I think will go a very long way towards, you know, and, and I, I don't know what the answer is to be clear. Uh, it's simply a uh, finding a way to have a data sharing process that enables that jump. It would already, I think, be a huge benefit to the, to the world. Uh, you know. Nara. I, so the matchmaker exchange has been doing it and right now with the variant matching project we are actively working with other countries like uae uh, india italy brazil different groups in these countries now what we are seeing is in these countries they're also decentralized they're also in silos so i'm working with many different groups in these countries. I'm not working with one group, even in Brazil, I, I, like that is starting the, the project not too long ago, they already have many different groups that are trying to centralize. And also the other thing that I'm encountering is they have their own regulations that, that limit what these groups can do with other countries. So I don't know how NIH could maybe help to bridge that collaboration to help them to set up the rules by our rules or our rules by their rules in a way that would facilitate that. But these are some of the things, it's our resources. There are things that they just cannot do because they don't have the funding to do. 
is the only structure that is decentralized and the regulations of these countries. Each one of these countries that I just said has different rules that prohibit them from just broadly sharing the data with everybody else. So we do have work with one group in Brazil right now that they just sent the data from the database to us, to us to process everything together and analyze all together. It was a process to be, to be able to do that. So I don't know, maybe NIH would be able to bridge a little bit more of that, these collaborations. I don't know how, but. In the back. So uh, imagining, imagining a world with unlimited resources and will, um, but, but respecting these issues about local control and distributed kind of analyses, there is, there is a technical opportunity to do joint calling using the pangenome resource or a version of it maybe augmented with uh, data from Nomad and other, other consortium um, uh, like UK, UK Biobank, then that, that resource itself is a place to harmonize the data. It, like the, the reference system contains variation, it contains potentially all low frequency variation that you might tend to access. Um, maybe obviously de novo stuff won't be there, but um, this could be a, a kind of rallying point for groups because they, they can run the analysis of the data locally, it doesn't have to leave anywhere but it's coordinated globally using a reference system that includes all the alleles that we're, we're interested in at any reasonably low frequency. Um, it won't solve everything, but that could, that could provide a basis for many discoveries um, of, of things of relatively low frequency, yet which are nevertheless shared among individuals, like this example of the, of the indel that, that, was, that was shown. So that, I mean, that, that would be an amazing thing to promote, but there, to my knowledge, there's no effort to really yeah. try to bring those things together. We have the pangenome project, which is like, you know, going to make perfect assemblies, but then we have, have a, most of the variant information for small variants is not in that shape. It's, it's from short read data sets. They're very large. How do we bring them together? Um, once we bring them together, technically this is all possible to do, but, but really it's an issue of curation and organization. I think. Okay. Last call for any points people really feel they wanted to have made that we didn't have a chance. Gary and then Doug. <laughs> I, I just, I, it bugs me a little bit. Negative data. There's a difference in negative data and a negative result, how you define it. I just want to point out that a well-executed experiment that shows you the variant doesn't have effect in the system you have is valuable. Mm. So I don't want us to go away from thinking, well, all right, knock out the mouse, didn't create a phenotype or some other kind. That's still valuable. And that's why you have to share that data. And that's why we have to apply platforms. So using the term negative data, is negative result is maybe we should find a better term. And I can't think of one, but I'm sure some of you guys <laughs> might be able to. But just a suggestion. Thanks. In our assays, we call that a reference-like result. Uh, but the point <laughs> I wanted to make is, uh, yeah, the point I wanted to make is, this is going out on a limb here, so don't crucify me if I'm wrong, my clinical colleagues. I think I was expecting to hear about when I came here, because it's just an interesting thing on the research side for me, is my understanding is that, you know, people have started to leverage big cohorts and biobanks to discover many individuals who do not meet like the clinical definition of a disease, like a rare, highly penetrant, blah, blah, blah disease. But they have some aspects of the phenotype that you can find. And, and I, in a, again, completely naive, don't shoot me, way thought, okay, well, maybe an entree into understanding rare disease, because you have these N of one or very small N kind of problem, is to go that there that there will probably for most of those diseases be these like lesser effect variants that drive subclinical or incorrectly diagnosed phenotypes. And shouldn't we be going and finding those? Because then our pool of individuals that we can study grows and we learn stuff. So I totally naive again, but that's the thing that I didn't hear that I was kind of curious about. Any comments or responses to that? Heidi? No, I, I actually think that's a spot on. I do think that is a, a trend and will help us actually understand true penetrance in an unascertained, you know, bias ascertained population. So I, I do think that's important. I, you know, one of the challenges is the, the level of phenotyping of the average population biobank is not optimized for rare disease and in general is challenging. But if there's opportunity to recontact, you know, and, and other ways to in interrogate, I think it's a ripe, you know, area of investigation. 
and I, I guess the thing I wonder is in re-envisioning like what a, what a coordinated effort looked like, is there some way to build into say all of us or make contacts with other people kind of doing that, at least some cohorts of phenotyping that would be good enough to patch some of the, or fix some of the shortcomings that you talked about? Yeah, I, th I think, you know, trying to create sort of a consortium of rare disease people looking at population cohorts would be great. Also, the fact that all of us has this 20, you know, 20 uh, limitation so you, is horrible for rare disease research. Um, so we do need to break down that rule that all of us has put into place that you can't publish any aggregate data if it's not 20 or more people that that eliminates all rare disease basically. To follow, up with, follow up with that, um, children's hospitals are a really good source of phenotypes for rare diseases. So the GIC, again, is an example, but you don't have to go to these consortiums. You can also try to partner with, or maybe NIH can try to, uh, you know, create a phenotype network or something. I mean, that's what GIC is kind of doing anyway, but maybe something more genetics focused, because they're kind of clinical informatics focused with some gen genomics added in but they're not specifically genetics, right. you know what I mean? They're, so maybe there's something along those lines because that would get phenotypes. If there's a bigger project trying to look at rare diseases, you know, and recontact and things like that, that's a population that's the low hanging fruit of the children that first, you know, establish themselves as, are established with rare diseases, so. Okay, thank you. So we're gonna switch now. It's not indicated quite on the agenda, but the way we're gonna do this is start to move into the recommendation section, which Lisa's gonna be picking up in full force after the break. But what we're asking, what we're gonna do right now is give you all some time to brainstorm. There's post-it notes and pens. Is there, I think Lisa's gonna pull up a slide. Um, where we're just asking you all to take a minute to think and write down some things that you have as recommendations for NHGRI in, I'm going to scope it a little bit, Gary, in this space of what are things that you think, you know, and you're only going to, you know, at most everybody can have, you know, what you can fit on a post-it note and however many post-it notes you can generate in 10 minutes, you know, so pick your top things about what are things that you think we should be doing to advance research in the discovery and diagnosis of rare disease, Mendelian disease? Anything you'd add to that scoping part? Well, do, can we have that slide, Sarah? Did we manage to, okay. <laughs> like, I don't so, know how to pull the slide so What the slide is gonna do is talk about, we're, we're having, you know, we're gonna, silo you, we're gonna put a constraint. You can talk, you can put your ideas into one of two categories. You can put it into something that you think is a big idea or like a long range term idea or a short, a smaller idea or what I think um, the term Lisa put forward is reasonable. So what's something you could imagine as doing in the next two to three years kind of reasonably, and then the other, or is it something, you know, that you're going to say is a pie, you know, a, a big term, long term scope. Um, we are not going to find a slide. It's okay. Um, huh? <laughs> We've got 138 slides. Yes. Yeah. Slide okay. So think big. Money's no object. It might take time to be reasonable. You might not even be possible, but you think it's something we should aim for or think big or think reasonable. It's ready to start now. It's achievable. You know, it's not going to cost more than three to five million dollars, um, you know, types of ideas. We're interested in both. You can have something intermediate and then just decide which category. Put some stuff on the post-it notes and then in the back there's a whiteboard and you can stick it on one side or stick it on the other. People online, you can also participate by putting it in the chat and adding your ideas. And we're just gonna give everybody 15 minutes. There's post-it notes and pens. If anyone doesn't have a post-it note or pen, I don't know that we got some on the back table, raise your hand and we'll get some to you. Um, you and on the whiteboard, is there, a, is there a big side and yeah. a reasonable yeah, side? Okay. Labeled. <laughs> okay, great. And then if you see like other, post-it notes that are kind of in line with your post-it note, 
stick your post-it notes together and a little group of post-it notes. That'll be helpful for us as we try to like make sense of this. I'm really looking forward to like one flying home with like a stack of random post-it notes <laughs> after this, by the way. So one idea for post-it note, again, we have 15 minutes for this and then was it a 20 minute break? Yeah, so you can, t so put your post-it notes up, take the break, we'll reconvene at, at 11 o'clock. Well, sorry, sorry. What time would we reconvene, Sarah? That does. Okay, we'll we'll do this, and then we'll put the break and slide up when we're ready. But fifteen minutes now to think and write some ideas and stick them on. We have different size post-it notes too. So, like, if you don't have the bigger post-it notes in front of you, but you need more space, like, phone a friend, get some big post-it notes. There's all kinds of 